for joining us. And please continue to join us by worshiping the Lord, by sitting, standing, and um, yeah.
Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on all of us today. Each one of us, Father God, we come, and we come here to receive from you today, Lord. And then what we receive, we return back to you in blessings and in praise and in worship. That you would be glorified in this place, Father. So as we sing poured out, Lord God, we pray that, that a wave of that mercy, the wave of your grace, the wave of your peace, the wave of your love would just be poured out in this place today. And Lord, that we wouldn't just receive it selfishly, Father, but we would uh, receive it unto ourselves so that we could give it to others as we leave from here. And as we go through our week, Lord God, that we would, as you've poured out into us, Lord, that we would share that love and that mercy and that grace and that peace with all those we come in contact with. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a very special day here at New Hope Vineyard Church. And uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Tony Buxel, and I serve as a pastor here. And one of the great honors that, uh, that I get as being a pastor here is dedicating children to the Lord. And there's few things better than that. And, uh, and so as we look to do that today, we look at Psalm 127, verse 3, that, say, that says, Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Our children are reward from the Lord himself. And as believers, we're called to recognize that children belong first and foremost to God. God in his goodness gives children as gifts to parents, not only to have uh, that awesome pleasure, but also to bear that responsibility for caring for them. And what a wonderful privilege it is. Because children belong to the Lord first and are given by grace as gifts to parents, it is only proper and appropriate that children be dedicated back to God. That's why we do this. And some people say, well, why is it in the vineyard that you dedicate children instead of baptize children or baptize babies? And we recognize that throughout the New Testament, when we see baptisms, that all of them are a response to a conscious decision to follow Jesus, that uh, someone is of age to make that lifelong commitment of following Jesus before they are baptized. With babies and children under the age of consent, we dedicate them to the Lord. We stand as a church family with their biological families, and we all are their spiritual family, committing to love them, committing to love their families, and uh, as they are part of the New Hope Vineyard Church family. That's why we're here today. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about it. I hope you are too. So I'm going to ask... Uh, Parents, if you would bring your children forward and families, you may come with them. Today, and I'll start with ladies first, we are, ve uh, we are dedicating Faye. So Faye, come on, come on up. And Camden and Waylon, come on up, fellas. And Elias and Ezekiel are on their way up. They got a little bit longer way to come, and that's okay because their legs are only that long. So it's all right, we'll wait. You guys just come on up where we can see you. And this is exciting stuff. I'm going to have you guys just come this way a little bit so that the people at home can see you. And why don't you guys scooch up front. Be careful there, Erica, not to go over the edge. But come on up front so you're in the light. Again, we want people at home to be able to see and squish in like you like each other and all that. Come on up here, guys. Hey. Hi. Come on. This is going to be fun. Get on up here. He's like, yeah, this ain't going to be fun. Come on up here. Hi, how are you? It's exciting. Come on, get in here, guys. Wow, isn't this a great looking group? Come on. Awesome. Well, I'm going to stand down here because this is who you're here to see, right? And, uh, and so to the family, parents, grandparents, and extended family, in the name of Jesus, I charge you to love God with every ounce and fiber of your being and to teach your children the same. As you love God and love one another, you will model to these children a wonderful way of life that will bless God and bring him glory. 
So by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your children to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying, I do. Having come freely, I now ask that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and his people so that these children may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you vow by God's help and in partnership with the church to provide these little ones with a healthy Christian home, to raise them in the truth of the Lord's instruction and discipline, and to encourage them to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior one day? If so, please respond by saying, I do. Awesome. This is exciting stuff. It's your turn now, congregation. Would you stand with me, congregation? I want you all to look at these. Look at these awesome faces. Aren't they great? But we have a commitment, too, in the family of God. This is our family. And so parents have the first responsibility, but parents need the help and support of a greater community. So I direct my question now to this church family. Being in the presence of the Almighty God today, do you as believers in Christ hereby declare that you will love, pray for, and spiritually support these families? If so, please say, we do. Do you vow with God's help to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ to help these parents and families be faithful to God, to help teach and train these children in the way of the Lord so that one day they may trust him as his Lord and Savior? If so, please say, we do. All right. And uh, I'm going to invite, uh, if you have any other family or friends or leaders of the church, if you'd come up, my my elders, my, my team of, of uh, executive team and ministry council, let's gather around these families. And we really want to pray and dedicate these beautiful children. Thank you. Oh. All right. Thank you for Faye, Lord. Thank you for this family. We dedicate her to you in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, guys. How are you? Lord, we thank you for Waylon and Camden, these two young men sitting before us, these little guys that we just love and adore. And we dedicate them to you in the name of Jesus. Can you guys give me a high five? All right. All right. Good stuff. All right, Elias and Ezekiel. Hey, guys, how are you? Look, can you come over here? Come down here, little boy. Look, look at this. Look at this handsome fellow, would you? Oh, man, those cheeks are great. We dedicate you guys and this family in the name of Jesus. Father God, we dedicate all these children to you. We ask that you would protect, love, and care for them until they are old enough to care for themselves. That one day they would seek you and make a personal decision to follow you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless, keep, and preserve Faye and Camden and Waylon, Elias and Ezekiel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Guys, these are your kids. We are just going to uh, continue in our worship of the Lord. You know, people think that worship just means singing. But we believe that worship is every part of our service, from the first hello to the last amen. Last amen. The fellowship we have out there is worship to God. Singing our praises is worship to God, and then presenting these little ones. What greater act of worship could we have? It's wonderful. Families. Uh, I just want to say a special thank you to you guys. You uh, have honored us dearly by allowing us to be your church family today, by allowing us to dedicate your children before the Lord. It, it is truly an honor, and it is an act of worship 
that we take very seriously. We're going to continue in our worship with one more song. And uh, I invite if you'd like to stand, if you'd like to sit, if you'd like to raise your hands. However you worship, feel comfortable worshiping here at New Hope Vineyard. Good morning, Vineyard family. Isn't it good to be here? My name's Rod. I'm on the exec team here at uh, New Hope and just love being part of this family. Uh, before announcements, uh, I want to share a quick testimony about how God showed up at a high bike week. 
Uh, you might, most of you probably know, Charles and I are involved with uh, Christian Motorcyclists Association, as well as Randy and Cindy, Roger and Mary. Um, and Ohio Bike Week is a busy week. And um, I was basically in charge of finding CMA members from anywhere we could find them to staff the booth. And it was difficult this year. And I got to admit, I went into Ohio Bike Week with probably the worst attitude that I've ever had going into the bike week. God showed up. Uh, I mean, like, the day before bike week started, I found out that I had to have this done. We were supposed to set up the booth on Friday morning. So I had to put out a last minute plea. Can someone help? Because I couldn't be there. People stepped up. During the course of the week, we had people from Akron, Lima, that hadn't signed up, that showed up and said, how can we help? Fill the spots we needed filled. We had the best location for our booth that we've ever had. So the organizers were very good to us. And we probably got to pray with more people than we ever have at Bike Week. So, <laughs> praise God. Even when you're going with a bad attitude, he shows up. So, on with announcements. Uh, again, I'm Rod. If you're a first time guest here, there is a paper, uh, a connection card in the seat back in front of you. We'd love it if you would fill that out. Yes, Christopher's holding one up there. I didn't bring the demo. Um, fill it out. Let us know how you found us. And for every first-time guest that fills one of those out and puts it in the offering or in the box out in the gathering place, we're going to donate $10 to Pontifex Food Outreach. And uh, there's also a gift pack out there at the gathering place table with a free download of music, grab one of those on your way out. Um, and uh, viewers at home, uh, we're glad you joined us today. And if you have a prayer request or questions or anything, you can connect with us by just logging on to uh, newhopevineyard.org slash connect and let us know what your questions or your prayer requests are. And um, Touch base with us that way. Okay, kids, Pam's waiting for you at the door, and teens, Ray's gonna take the teens. It's good to watch that many kids going out to VKC, and hope there's some teens headed that way. And it was great to see all those really little ones. They'll be heading that way for too long, before you know it. Okay, a couple more announcements. Next Saturday, the 11th, is an all-church work day from 9 to noon. And there are jobs inside, outside. There's a lot of stuff to do to, you know, keep the building and grounds looking good. So there's jobs for everyone. So please... Give us a hand keeping this place looking good um, next Saturday, 9 to noon. And on the 19th, the first church in the yard. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also Father's Day, so bring your dads. Um, and, you know, it is a potluck. If you're... And this year, your last name starts with A through M. Bring a salad or a side dish, please. If your last name starts with N through Z, bring a dessert to share. We love dessert. And as, as always, the church is going to supply the meat. 
but uh, we are going to start having a donation box um, at these meals and encourage you to consider throwing in a few bucks to help defray the cost. Um, because I'll be honest with you, we are operating on a very tight budget right now. Just like the rest of the economy is. And we also need help setting, setting up, serving, cleaning up. And there are sign-up sheets out in the gathering place for uh, church in the yard. So, you know, if everybody would just put their name down once, we'd have it covered. And it's fun to serve. Okay. I think that's it for the announcements. So we'll continue with our tithes and offerings. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are so faithful in every way. And uh, we just thank you for this time to gather in your house, in your name. And we thank you for how you've blessed us. And we just want to pray a blessing on on the, the gifts and the givers this morning um, and give us as a church team wisdom in using that, being good stewards to build your kingdom. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Work day church and yard things like that come up it's what a family does this is think about like being with your own family there's things we just need to chip in and do around the house so good stuff there is a rumor going around i think it's substantiated this saturday there will be donuts so if you need to be bribed i mean this is not a body that turns away donuts right i'm just saying my wife is laughing very hard at that and i'm not sure how i feel about that but Good stuff. God is good. Man, what a great morning it's been already, isn't it? Whew. Wow, it's good. I wasn't really waiting on an amen, but thank you. Uh, we are continuing in our series, Jesus Said That. We're talking about the red letters in our Bibles, in our Gospels of things uh, that Jesus said while he was teaching on earth during his ministry on earth. And um, today, uh, we're going to talk about some things, and again, there are teachings of Jesus that we like to ignore. Some of them get a little uncomfortable. Some are like, well, maybe he meant that for then, and it's different now. But uh, as we read through the Bible, we understand that Jesus' teachings are very relevant, and they're just as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago when he spoke them. Because let's be honest, truth doesn't change. Truth never changes. A lie changes a lot, but truth will never change. Change. And we're going to look at three spiritual practices or disciplines that Jesus calls us to during today's teaching. And we'll find out that these practices come with a great tone of expectation. When Jesus is talking about them, um, it's not something that's an option, but something that should be part of every believer's life. And so we're going to look at the uh, when statements, not if statements, and you'll understand what I mean about that in just a minute. But Father, we ask that you would come as we open up your word today. As we read your word, may we hear the voice of Jesus speaking it as he was on that mountain 2,000 years ago. Just move by your Holy Spirit to help us receive what you have for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, if you've been following along, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, last week we kind of skipped ahead to the end and understood that Jesus said, you know, there's some very important things here, and it's more than just listening to them. We need to do them. We need to be like the builder who builds his house on the rock. Remember we talked about that, and, and, and that when the storms come, the building stands, and you notice Jesus never said, if the storm comes. You notice he didn't say, I'll just take away all the storms. He said, storms are going to come. That's why we need our foundation built on Jesus. That's why our kids and our youth just went back there. Because they're building a good foundation on the word of God. So we're going to look at Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18. It'll be on your screens here or if you like to open your Bible. And if you're watching from home, it'll be on your uh, TV screen. 
So he starts out with a warning in this point of his sermon. We're kind of in the middle, about a, about a little over a third of the way through the Sermon on the Mount, and he stops to give us a warning. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So let's, let's put this in context because context is everything when we're reading any historical document, especially the Bible. And uh, we want to put his words in context so we know what he's kind of saying and why he's actually saying it. This, part, this is part of a much larger sermon. The sermon on the Mount goes through uh, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And so there's a continuity of when we read it completely. And um, in his preceding passage, Jesus was talking uh, to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, how they would make everything, even their religion, even their piety, they would make it public so everybody could see it and go, man, what, those are great guys. Look how holy they are. Look how righteous they are. And Jesus uh, condemned that statement that it was a, to be a private issue between us and God. But Jesus at one point in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 16 says this, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So is Jesus contradicting himself? Because he's saying, look, don't do everything in public, but let your light shine. No, Jesus was not schizophrenic at this time. Understand the last sentence here, that they may see your good deeds. Why? To glorify our Father in heaven. It's all about an attitude of the heart. Jesus was telling us that what we do in his kingdom is not about us, but it's about showing how good our God is. It's about the attitude of the heart. The Pharisees and stuff were doing everything so everyone else would see it and glorify them. And in this statement, Jesus is saying, no, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth so that other people would see you and then glorify God. Big difference there, right? All right. So, and this completely flies in the face of what we learn as a society, because everything's about us in society today, right? And uh, as I was trolling through social media this week, I came across this meme. It says this, if you can't read it. The gospel sounds very strange to a society that has been told that loving themselves is virtuous. Their heart is always right, and there is nothing more important than their happiness, gospel is very different than this. We're not about happiness. We're about true joy. That foundation that, that stands in any storm. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is external. And, and loving ourselves is one thing, but loving God and allowing him to love us is a totally different one. We are called, friends, to be counter-cultural ambassadors. We are pilgrims in a strange land, the Bible says. The call of Christ is the call to not conform to this world, to be transformed through the renewing of our minds. And this only comes about when we align ourselves with what God is doing, the will of God in his kingdom. And so uh, that's what Jesus is talking about in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. So let's look at some of these when, not if statements that, he's, that we talked about. So Jesus continues. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so my first thing I want to call our attention to today is Jesus says, when you give to the needy, not if. There's that tone of expectation. It's not an option. Giving is encouraged among Jesus' disciples. And it's even more than encouraged. It's actually expected. You know, the expectation is that Jesus' disciple would prioritize caring for the needy then and, and now. It's not an if statement. It's not going, hey, if it's convenient for you and you have time to give to the needy, he's saying when you give. It's as expected as, as breathing. And so to give us a little, again, a little more context of where we're going with this, he's talking about giving 
to the needy. We're talking there, the, the word is alms, giving alms to the poor. And uh, to give you a little more context, back in Jesus' day, um, there were three significant displays or outward expressions of piety in Jesus' era, especially among the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. The three of them, one we've already talked about already, is uh, giving to the needy, giving alms to the poor, prayer and fasting. These were three things that were brought up often, and they were brought up very publicly. They were done in public by these religious-type people who wanted to draw attention to themselves and go, look how special I am. They would go into the synagogue and go, look at this drachma I'm putting in here, instead of quietly just going and putting your offering in the box. They would announce it, it says. And it says here that the reward has already been given. There is no reward in heaven for those who have their reward on earth. Jesus is using this part of the Sermon on the Mount to address these three good godly deeds. They're all great, right? These are things that we need to be doing. They're expected of believers because at the time they were being perverted into a show. And what was meant for connecting us with God in some very real and meaningful ways became a self-centered attitude of, hey, look at how holy I am. So Jesus is correcting this behavior, stating that these things are important and should be prioritized in, by believers, but when done discreetly between us and God, and no one else needs to know. And then Jesus gives an admonition, a, a warning to those who are misusing these spiritual disciplines. If we do these things publicly, calling attention to ourselves, getting the pat on the back, that alone is the reward. There will be no heavenly blessings for that goodness. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather appear before God when it's my time and have him say, well done, good and faithful servant, than to have some human pat me on the back and go, nice job, buddy. I mean, I still like that too. So if you feel like doing that, that's great. But what a great thing to have your God tell you you were faithful. All right, well, let's continue with these other two. We talked about givings and alms to the needies. Let's talk about praying. And when you pray, there's that word again, isn't there? When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues, out on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. There's that pattern again. But when you pray, go into the room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. The Father knows what you need before you ask him. And again, we look at when you pray, not if you pray. It should be as natural to us as breathing. The Apostle Paul tells us that we're to pray continually, without ceasing, he says. It's who we are. It's our conversation with God. It's our, it's our plug into the source. I don't know about you, I love my toaster at home because it makes some good toast, but when I unplug it from the wall, it doesn't toast stuff very well at all. It becomes ineffective, right? When we unplug ourselves from the source, we become ineffective. That's why Jesus is saying when you pray, not if it's convenient. Again, Jesus here is correcting poor behavior, stating that prayer is an important part of our lives as believers, should be done reverently and privately. Now, we do have corporate prayer, and I'll address that in just a second. But he's saying here, prayer should be simple. It should be direct. It should be reverent with an attitude that longs solely to please God, not gain attention for ourselves. And so what do we do with corporate prayer? That means praying with other believers, right? Sometimes we'll pray like I prayed before the sermon. We prayed over our little ones. You pray at home groups. Sometimes we gather around people, pray for healing. Uh, is he saying that we shouldn't do that? Well, no. Again, this is about the attitude of our heart. Why are we doing this? It's not about location. It's not about the company we share. It's about the attitude of our heart. Are we doing this to please God or to please other people and please ourselves? Are we calling attention to our Lord or are we calling attention to me? And how do I know that corporate prayer is okay? Because let's look at this probably most famous 
uh, passage in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus teaches us how to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Some people call it the Our Father. Then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, a lot of us probably grew up in churches that, that said that, right? Anybody here beside me grew up saying that like every Sunday or at least a few times a month, right? And some of you might have said, instead of debts, you might have said trespasses. Growing up in our church, we said sins. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's all the same thing. Those who spiritually offended us is what it's about. But let's look at something very important here. And I've noticed this before, and I've, I say it all the time, but no, it didn't really hit me like it did as I was preparing for this week. He starts with our Father who art in heaven. He goes on to give us today our daily. He doesn't say me. This is a corporate prayer. This is a prayer to be prayed among believers. He continually uses the first person plural pronoun of our and us and we. And he never once says me or my or mine. Have you thought about that before? Because this is the first time this week where I've really hit me. That this is so critical. That this is a prayer that is meant to bring believers together. It's about inclusion. It's about unity in the family of God. And we just did a, a series on prayer where we kind of broke down uh, the Lord's Prayer, and I don't want to get into that day, but the one thing I want you to, to get from today more than anything about this prayer is that it's meant for us, not me, not individuals. It's meant for us. It binds us and unifies us. It connects us to the source. Wow, cool stuff. Then, after he says that, now, we, we say, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And Jesus feels the need at the end of this to put kind of a, a stipulation, a caveat, a requirement, a condition, if you will. And he says this, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whoa. We need to take this seriously, folks, because we've been taught it's okay to hold a grudge. We've been taught it's okay to be in a snit so long as you don't do anything really bad to the person. What we need to realize is that forgiveness is critical, not only to them, but more to us. There's that saying, you know, when you forgive someone, you set two prisoners free. And that is so true. And the funny thing is we, uh, some translations say, uh, if, if you do not forgive their sins, your father cannot forgive your sins. And it's like, wait a minute, can't God do anything? And it's not a matter of God's ability. It's about God's character. He can't forgive if you're not willing to forgive because that's his character. His character is of forgiveness, and we need to be sinless around him. We, we remember last week where Jesus said, be perfect as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. And we know that that's impossible, but we do our best as we strive to be more like Jesus. So the main requirement for forgiveness is, is to forgive others. God has set up a system, a wonderful system of repentance, forgiveness, grace, and mercy so that we can have eternal life. And then it's our job, once we've received that, to give it freely to everyone else. That's our job, guys. When we say to love God and make his love known, which is the mission of this church. Part of loving God is loving his people. The way we make God's love known is by forgiving one another quickly. Right? Slow to anger, quick to forgive, slow to speak. Third thing Jesus says, when, there's that word again, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces 
to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who is seen what is done in secret will reward you. There's that thing again. What we do in the name of Jesus, what we do in the name of God to glorify him is rewarded by God when we do it just with him, that attitude of our heart. When you fast, and he talks about the, the people of the day, how hypocritical they are. They, they walk around and and they pretend, you know, they don't, they don't look like things are normal. They would dress themselves differently. They, you know, they wouldn't comb their hair. They would look a muss, and they'd walk around, oh, and they'd go, wow, that guy, he must, have been, he must have been fasting for a long time. He must be really holy. And instead, Jesus is going, no, 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 go in, wash your face, put oil in your ha- on your hair. Guys, shave a little bit. Ladies, put on some makeup. Let's look like you would any other day so that people don't know you're fasting. Fasting for us in modern day, uh, for modern day Christians has become something we do very rarely, usually only during Lent, and most of the time just so we can let people on Facebook know that we're holy because we're giving up like broccoli for Lent. I gave up broccoli when I became a Christian just to cover all my bases. I even did it before I was a believer because I just knew one day it would come in handy. But again, this is something between us and God. And the true, uh, you know, and we, we look at this. I, I, I found this. I love this. OMG, the pastor says we have to fast and pray this month. Giving up chocolate for 30 whole days. How will I cope? Prayers appreciated. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, right? I'll just let that speak for itself. But this true spiritual discipline of fasting is a powerful tool. Hear that. The true spiritual discipline of fasting is a powerful, powerful tool. And lately it's been weakened to become something that we do because we have to. And it's rarely effective because it's done uh, without the correct attitude. It's lost its oomph. Because it's not become a sacrificial thing. It's become a trendy thing. Hey, what are you giving up for Lent? I'm giving up chocolate. I'm giving up TV. I'm not going to go to the mall for the next six weeks. Let's pray. It's going to be hard. And these are nice gestures. But the act of fasting is really the act of sacrifice. Sacrifice something we need that's why when we read about fasting in the Bible, it's always food, sometimes water, but usually food. And then we take the time that we would use to prepare that food, at the time it takes to eat that meal, and we give it to God, and we pray, and we dig into his word. Fasting. The big thing to understand about fasting, and I, want, I really want to make this clear, is this, fasting is not about sacrificing something so that God will do something for you in return. It's not twisting God's arm. That's coercion. That's manipulation. It's not only wrong, but it doesn't work with God. In fa- instead, fasting, when done uh, with the correct attitude, the correct face, as it were, seeking God's guidance through this time, again, is very powerful. Fasting is to prayer and to Bible study as kind of that octane boost additive is to the fuel you put in your tank, right? It enhances our prayers. It energizes our time in God's word. And we fast, again, not to twist God's arm into giving us what we want. We fast. We'll put this on the screen, too. We fast to honor the fact that God is already at work in our situation and hears our prayers and honors our sacrifice. It's an act of thanksgiving. We know you're already working, Lord. Let me put a little tiger in the tank and get it going. To show you I'm serious about this. God was very serious about redeeming us when he sent his son to the cross. We can be very serious when we fast. When we sacrifice. So giving 
praying, fasting, three of many spiritual disciplines that Jesus focused on, again, because they were the three that were outwardly displayed in his time. But there are so many more. There's worship, serving, study, silence, solitude, celebration, and on and on. There are just dozens of spiritual disciplines that we utilize to help us grow. We actually have a class, and I'm just going to do a quick plug about these that are part of our discipleship series called Soul Building. It's called Finding a Path, a Guide to Spiritual Disciplines. It's coming up. We're going to be starting discipleship classes again in the fall. So I hope, I hope that you will connect with those and be a part of those so that we can all grow in Jesus. And sometimes we get that, well, I've been in church for a long time. I kind of know about that stuff. I don't know about you, but I need a shot. I need a booster shot every once in a while to help remind me why I'm doing what I'm doing. But I'm going to tell you this, don't wait for a class to start. Don't wait to, to go to a special class or a church or, or, or a synagogue or, or a seminary or anything else to start. We've already been given the best instruction manual. It's called the Bible. Read it prayerfully study it, and then do what it says. God's already given us the how-tos. We just need to start doing it. We have these classes uh, just to kind of help uh, get around one another, to love one another and build up one another. So um, we are entering a season in this world where uh, these disciplines are, are more important than ever, and we are entering a season in this church where these disciplines are more important. People are in need. People need prayer. We need to be fasting. And, you know, we talked about doing it in private, but it's okay to have an accountability partner. It's okay to discuss it with your small group. Hey, small group, let's fast over this. Sometimes when you have major decisions to make or a, a, a job uh, interview coming up, Maybe you're thinking about moving or buying a house. Maybe God's moving you in a different way. It's good to get some friends and go, hey, would you pray and fast for me this week? It's a good thing. Our church family needs to be doing things like this. And so I'm going to um, I'm going to request something of you all and myself. I would love for us as a church body to commit to pray and fast. Right now, uh, we, we, last week we said goodbye to Christian and Summer. We love them dearly. They were doing a great work here, and they're going home to raise their first uh, baby, and that's exciting. We, we blessed them and sent them out. Um, but I want us to be praying and fasting that the Lord will bring us a, a new youth pastor, a new person to guide and direct our worship team. And so I'm asking you now to join me. It's in the month of June. I, want, I would like for you to pick one day a week. That's only four, four days throughout the whole month. If you want to do more, that's fine. Don't go crazy on us. Where you will sacrifice just one meal during that week. Maybe you do it every Wednesday lunch or whatever. That's fine. And that you would take the time that you would normally prepare the meal and eat to pray that God would bring us the right person at the right time or the right people at the right time. Let's practice that together. If you need an accountability partner, talk to your prayer partner. That's why we have that ministry. Talk to your small group. Talk to a friend before you leave church and say, I need someone to help me with this. If you usually don't eat breakfast, that doesn't count as skipping a meal and sacrificing. I'm just going to be real with you, okay? Now, I will say this. Just practically speaking, if you have dietary issues like diabetes, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, something like that, please talk to your doctor before you get into this. I'm being serious here. God gave us doctors for a reason. Let's, let's use them and utilize their wisdom uh, before you do something that. But if you are willing to say, you know what, I will, I will commit one meal a week for the next four weeks of June to praying, to fasting, and to praying that the Lord will bring a new youth pastor to us, a new worship director to us. I would like for you to take the connection card that's in the seat back in front of you. I'd like for you to put your name on it. And then in that big section down below where it says comments, prayer record, uh, prayer requests, whatever, just put the word prayer. And a lot of you are thinking, okay, well, I'm going to do it, but I don't want to like sign anything. I'm, I'm kind of busy right now. And I don't feel like getting that card because it takes so much effort to do this and then that. Please do it so we know you're on board. This is a team effort here. 
And, and I want to know who's, who's praying together. I want to know who's on our team. And um, here's the thing. When we do these things together, big things can happen. I believe that with all my heart. So uh, not everyone here is, is uh, familiar with the, the practice of, uh, of fasting, especially the practical aspects. So we created a little half-page sheet. It's available on the welcome and information desk as you leave. Uh, and it just kind of gives us practical steps, how to do it, how not to do it, things to avoid, and things like that when you fast. A couple things to take from today, though. All three of these things, fasting, praying, giving alms to the needy, were never a, an if statement by Jesus. They were always a when statement. It was always about expectation. When you do, you're already doing them, just keep doing them kind of thing. That's what we're called to as, as believers in Christ. And again, that other thing I just want to draw your, uh, your attention to just one more time as the worship team comes on up, the Lord's Prayer. Let's remember that it's always our Father. Our Father. Not mine, but it's a corporate prayer. And as we pray it, remember our brothers and sisters. So if you know the Lord's Prayer. Would you stand with me and let's pray it? And if you don't know it, just enjoy listening to it. If you are used to saying debts, say debts. If you're used to saying trespasses, say trespasses. I've done this with people in 14 different languages at one sitting, and it all worked out okay. One word's not going to kill us. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Feel free to stand. Feel free to raise your hands. We're going to continue in our worship of the Lord. Come on up, Larry. morning was a very good uh, lesson on strengthening each individual here. We're not far from a real storm hitting us. There's something coming. It will touch you financially. It will touch you faith-wise. But remember, you're part of God's body. And you have to remember to call upon that. My wife reminded me that this morning. That things are going to happen. But God is the one that will preserve us. It won't be the government. They got us heading down a path that's almost destruction. But just remember what you heard this morning was a was a message of how you can gain hope, how you can maintain faith, and how you can stand against the storm that is going to come. I'm not a weatherman, but I tell you, it's coming. And you want to remember that. And you want to remember how you can stand firm and strong. And God bless these words.
card if you will put your name put prayer down here if you're willing to join us i'm going to tell you this too it's not just for this church this body for that pastoral position when we begin practicing these spiritual disciplines like prayer and fasting worship it, it changes ourselves when we're going through things and we're praying for others it's amazing how our own hearts change when we enter into the presence of god Things cannot remain the same in the presence of God. So when we go before him, not only are we lifting up needs, but we ourselves are growing and changing. So how's that for an extra incentive to pray along with us this week? And if you need prayer today, if you came and you're needing uh, just a touch from the Lord, uh, John is over here on your left and, and Jim and, and Carolyn on, our, on your right. Please see them. They would love to pray with you today. On your way out, um, you can take these connection cards that you filled out and put them in the basket on the welcome and information table. Okay, that'll be on your left-hand side as you go out. And make sure you see Lori Brickmanis, who has invitations to church in the yard. Please feel free to invite friends and family uh, to come be a part of that. And uh, God bless you guys. Have an amazing week.